we are walking up a muddy path to Conica Tower, up amongst the trees where we can hear the rooks and the crows cawing away, building their nests. And we're looking, uh, looking across to the parkland of Dunster Castle, where there's mistletoes in the tall trees. We can see on the other side of the coast, the Welsh coast, and then over to the right are the Quantocks rising up. With all the rooks and crows and jackdaws, we don't need any background music. And we've also got some blackbirds in the yew tree behind us. Uh, I wonder if they're getting the berries. The church bell sounding. Right, so Dunster is spread before us. The castle dominating up on the, on the hill and then the church and all the little higgledy-piggledy houses. Um, obviously here the sheep and the lambs in the meadows. <laughs> it's a quintessentially country scene. Here we are as Conica Tower suddenly appears amongst the trees. And apart from the birds, we can hear the roar of traffic on its way to Minehead and beyond. The information board tells us that this tower, Conniger Tower, was built by the Luttrell family who owned Dunster Castle as a 19th century folly and it was designed for the views that you would see and walking up here through the woods which would not have been as extensive as now and there'd be strategic places to stop and admire the views but the name Conniger comes from two medieval words Coney meaning rabbit and Garth meaning garden for this was once a warren where rabbits were bred for food I can just about see the castle if I stand on my tiptoes because the red brick is blending into the sort of brackeny background and before too long these bushes will be all greened over and then you won't see it. We're looking at the old yarn market which was built in 1609 and reflects the importance of the wool trade to Dunster and when market day was the most important day all around. This was built by George Luttrell of Dunster Castle and repaired in 1647 according to the date on the weather vane. There's been a castle here for over a thousand years. It started as a Saxon stronghold and finished as a comfortable Victorian house. Um, the oldest part is the gatehouse and it was remodelled by, I'll just check the leaflet, um, Anthony Salvin between 1868 and 1872 for the Luttrell family and they lived here for over 600 years before giving it to the National Trust in the 1970s. We're looking down from the Pet Cemetery to the Tenants Hall, where it's now a nice cafe, down to the Gatehouse. The dogs have been buried here since 1924 and at the beginning here anyway they all seem to be retrievers. We turned the corner and suddenly came upon this topiary, this shaped hedge. So we went a bit further to look and it says there's something strange in the hedge. Explore the area around you and see if you can spot the dragon of Dunster. 
but he's been here for so long that leaves have grown up around his stumbling, slumbering form. Be careful, you don't want to wake the dragon. We're up at the keep now, looking down onto the castle with magnificent views around. It's, it's really lovely to be up here looking down. It's a beautiful spring morning and we've driven up and up from Minehead and across the moors and we're now on Bossington Hill looking down to Porlock, the Vale of Porlock. This land belongs to the National Trust now but it was part of the vast Holnacoat estate and we're seeing some ancient looking trees around here and we can hear the water but not see it and we can hear the birds, but not see them either. This memorial hut is for, was built for Sir Thomas Dyke Ackland, and it, the spot was selected by his youngest surviving son, John Barton, Arundel Ackland, and it was built in 1878, and it shows the son's love for his father, which we all read on the other side. This plaque tells us more about the father who was so loved and it says in remembrance of the father who during more than 50 years took Sunday walks up this coombe with his children and grandchildren training them in the love of nature and of Christian poetry this wind and weather hut was built. A poem by Keeble Needs no show of mountain hoary winding shore or deepening glen, where the landscape in its glory teaches truth to wandering men. Give true hearts but earth and sky and some flowers to bloom and die. Homely scenes and simple views, lowly thoughts may best infuse. When we were up by the memorial hut, we could hear the water and not see it but we found it. In fact, we've been following this stream all the way down through the woods. And it's like all these paths, it didn't seem as if it was going to be very far, but it has felt quite a long time. And so we've crossed a very small stone bridge covered in moss. And we're gonna follow this again, right down now to the little village of Selberthy. These lovely old walls are probably medieval in origin to protect the, the crops and the animals. And when the Acklands had this area, they planted the trees. So the woods, the, the walls became quite um, ruined. But there has been a project in the last 20 years by local people and the National Trust to restore them. And very impressive they are too. We have just left the main road and we're going up to Selworthy Beacon. And this morning we went on the right hand side down the hill through the woods. This time we're going up to the top of the beacon. Here we are at Selworthy Beacon and right by the trig point looking across to Wales. And after walking up being sheltered by the gorse up we come to the wind the invigorating wind.
we are in the picturesque village of Bossington, which is now owned by the National Trust. But back in Saxon times, it was part of the Abbey of Athelney. And then it became the estate of the Ackland family. But after the Second World War, it was given to the National Trust. And it really is a beautiful setting. What a beautiful, clear, fast flowing stream this is. I don't know what the wheat, the, the grass is growing in it, but it all looks so lovely. And the primrose is coming down. Our walk today is going to be a circular walk up to Hurlstone Point through the woods and we're crossing over Horner Water. We came along and suddenly saw this lovely carpet of blue and I really don't know what these flowers are so I should be looking it up. There are violets further along but these are not violets. And there's some primroses. The view opens up beautifully here the sun shining as well which is an added bonus. We're looking across to Porlock Weir and the woods which go up to Culbone and then down the coast along to Linton and Lynmouth which we can't see. We're looking down to Porlock Bay, where over the past 8,000 years, occasional westerly and northwesterly gales have shifted the pebbles eastwards to create first a spit, then a bar, enclosing the land behind. When storms breach the bank, it would be rebuilt to protect the pastures and the fresh water marsh behind it. But there was a huge storm in October 1996 which breached the bank and pushed the beach 20 to 30 metres inland and created a saltwater marsh and it has been decided now to let nature take its course. This is Hailstone Point and I'm in the old Coast Guard lookout building which was strengthened during the Second World War to withstand gunnery practice. And at the moment, the wind is quite cold coming off the sea. We're going to make our way back now, the way we came instead of the circular route, because even though that was muddy, the other one's going to be even muddier. And coming downhill with mud is not a good idea. A change of plan, instead of going back the way we came, we're taking this detour down to the beach. So we're going to walk along the Shingle Beach to Bossington. Well, we've made it down the cliff path. You can hardly see it looking back up and we're just hoping the pebbles aren't going to be too tricky to walk on. At last we've left the Shingle Beach and just come down and straight away we're out of the wind and out of the sound of the sea practically. Really sheltered in the spot. But looking across we can see the path we came through the woods and then under the, the hill up to the Coast Guard lookout and then down, down onto the beach when the pebbles
We are at Malmesmead in the Lorna Doon Valley and right at the boundary of Devon and Somerset on a beautiful spring morning. We've come up the Badgeworthy Valley from Malmesmead along a narrow, very muddy track. We've got the Badgeworthy stream babbling away down below and in the valley there is the cloud, it's called Cloud Valley Farm and there's a campsite as well and pods <laughs> over there. So we're going down across a bridge into the farm and then on from there. It almost looks like a little nest up here, you know. We're standing in part of the country which R.D. Blackmore used for his novel Lorna Doon. He wrote it in the mid-19th century but it was set before that and this is a tale of outlaws in a secluded valley, the Doon Valley, and they capture the young Lorna and take her to live there. All sorts of dastardly things happen but this is part of the country where it was set. I really like this stone wall or as I learnt stone bank. The colour of the lichen is beautiful, um, sort of creamy coloured lichen here. And though we've got the mist all around us the birds are still singing and I'm hoping to see a Dartford warbler amongst the gorse. The gorse is all over Exmoor, such a bright, striking yellow, and it provides homes for all sorts of birds and insects. <laughs> 